Okay, welcome everybody. Just getting YouTube going here for those watching there. See a few of you coming in to the webinar now. Just getting YouTube going here. And let's cancel that out. Got it. Okay. Welcome, everyone. I'm Derek Oje, Executive Director with Conservatory Canada, and welcome to the Friday webinar on Zoom and also on CCTV YouTube channel. And I just want to go over a little bit here about what's coming up. Uh, if anyone didn't get to see it last week, we had Dr. Elaine Keeler give us a performance of Muzio Clementi's F-sharp minor sonata, which was really incredible, from her forte piano in her home. It's a Clemente 1802 Forte Piano. I would encourage any of you to go and look that up on the YouTube channel. You should find it fairly easily. And we're going to have Elaine back next week as well. She's going to talk for us a whole hour about ornamentation through the 1617 into the 1800s. Um, of course, we all make reference about ornaments and things in our teaching and little bits here and there. But to get it all at once in an ornamentation sort of workshop is going to be quite novel. And Elaine, with her you know extensive background in performing, I think I know I'm really looking forward to see what she has to say in terms of how we can think about ornaments. And she often throws out the caveat that, you know, a lot of what we're told in textbooks isn't right. And so it'll be interesting to see what her perspective is. And so I'd encourage you all to check that out. That's next Friday, 168 hours from now on November 11th. On November 18th, our first visit from Dr. Gilles Como from the University of Ottawa. He runs the piano lab there and is involved in all sorts of research. And so we're going to hear about why research is important uh, for, for us studio teachers and what it could mean for us potentially. He also has a new project. He's also the managing director of the, what is this called? The, health, the Music Health and Wellness Institute at University of Ottawa. And so I'm going to ask him some questions about that. And we hope to have him back later in the new year to talk a little bit more about that initiative and what that can mean for us. So that's what we have coming up in the next couple of weeks. Of course, the matter at hand here today our favorites, Eleanor Gummer and Cecile de Rosier, have joined us to talk to us more about music by women composers, and specifically today, the French connection, Louise Ferhank, uh, Mel Bonis, and uh, Jael. What's Jael's first name? I can never Marie. remember. Marie. Marie Jael. Very good. I know I've got this book here. I'm sure Eleanor will hold this up later, but Louise Ferhank, 25 Etudes. I look forward to reading through this. And of course, there's all sorts of other music and Eleanor publishes all of this stuff through One Eye Publications. I'll put some links in the chat box so that those of you watching live can check those out on her website. Uh, links to the CCTV YouTube channel. Um, that's about all for me in terms of introduction today. So I'm going to turn this over to Eleanor and Cecile. If anyone has questions for them, please throw them in the Q&A or in the chat box. So Eleanor, Cecile, thanks for joining us again today. And we look forward to your, your repertoire session here today. Thank you, Derek, and it's great to be back again. So today is particularly exciting with uh, the French connection. So we're going to begin with Louise Franck, who uh, lived from 1804 to 1875. Louise was a teenage piano prodigy and toured France. Uh, she was actually um, born into a, a musical family or bohemian family. She studied at the Paris Conservatoire with uh, Antoine Reicher, who knew Beethoven and also taught Liszt and Berlioz. Uh, she married um, another musician who encouraged her to compose, which was really quite unusual at the time. We're going to talk a little bit more about that a little later on. But a lot of times uh, men would forbid their women, uh, their wives from pursuing a career at all. So this was um, rather unique. So together they opened a publishing company um and uh hector berlioz was a big fan of hers as was robert schumann both praised her works she was hired as a professor at the paris conservatoire the only woman in the department at the time but she earned considerably less than her male counterparts she earned actually even less um than some less senior men so the men that were kind of at the bottom of the rung she was earning even less than they were so seven years into the job, she demanded more pay and she received equal pay. She was known um, for her etudes, among other works, 
In fact, her Opus 26 etudes were mandatory learning at the Paris Conservatoire for all students coming into the conservatory. So we're going to deal with a few of the etudes from Opus 50 today. And I'm going to share my screen here. The first one we're going to be going with, these are, by the way, great etudes. Uh, they're, they're very musical and um, each A2 deals with a different uh, specific technical feature. I'm using them a lot personally with my own students coming out of COVID. I found two things that were lacking rhythm because of often lags in the uh, in the sound, but also technique because I wasn't actually able to work with them on proper hand position, proper wrist movement. I, I was limited by what I could actually see on the camera and see on the screen. So these these pieces have been a lifesaver. And actually, one of my students said last week, I actually like these etudes. So rather than Hannon and Cherney, which can be pretty technical and a bit musically boring, these not only have technical features, but they're very musical features. So Cecile, do you want to tell us about number five? Yes. And I'll add that I have the same experience as you do. I started uh, teaching some of them to my students and I got the same reaction that they're so fun to practice, to work on, and they're so nice. So number five, like you said it's for um, alternate chords equally in both hands. So I'm gonna play it and we'll talk about it after. <laughs> challenges of that studies uh, are twofold. First, you have a melody in the right hand. And a counter melody in the left hand. And so it's a question of working on the, the phrasing and the balance between the two voices. Uh, also, it's all chords, right? So at the same time, you get the horizontal of the melody and the vertical of, of the chords. And so you need to keep the movements to a minimum to get um, a bright, a clear, bright sound and a, a good voicing of the chords. Uh, hands and fingers must be firm in order to transmit the energy. Uh, so, for example, uh, what I see often with students is a movement of the wrist. They will do something. Like that. Uh, that's uh, sort of, um, I'm thinking of Chopin's example of um, the, 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 the torso. Uh, being like a barrel of water, conductive of energy. So you have to let the energy, the water, go from the torso to the fingertips. So this, of course, is counterproductive. So all that works as a unit and wrist and arm, which makes it a lot easier to play. So, uh, and also use the, uh, the image of a trampoline that seems to work well with, uh, with students. Like, like arms and you bounce. Now, a few practice tips. Um, I would play the chords, each beat as a solid chord. Physical memory, the distances, uh, and the handprints. Uh, solid with both hands, then alternating. Uh, with the no 
notes of the melody, like I said, you play just one at a time and shape it and then both together. That helps a lot. Um, and I like uh, in announced suggestions in our edition to practice on a table or on the lid of the piano because you're not distracted by the, the sounds that you're creating uh, or by the melody, by the, you know, the shape of the phrase. Uh, it makes it easier to focus on the firmness of the fingers and the clarity uh, of the of the touch, the balance between the notes of the chords. And the funny thing is that, let's say if there's a finger that's not as firm as the others, you'll hear it in, in, the, in the wood, the sound of the wood. Um, so this is a, it's an exciting study, a very happy one. So Eleanor, um, you're gonna present the number let's, seven? Let's do number seven. So this one is on trills. suggests is that all of the trills should have an ending even if it's not indicated. Now to do a free trill, sometimes at a level five, which is where this etude is, can be difficult. So it's good to start with a measured trill and I use 30 seconds. And to help that, <laughs> tell my students animated alligator so animated alligator animated alligator and again here animated alligator and animated alligator now the left hand trill um, I this took me back to trying to teaching some of the Bach inventions that have those left hand trills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally digging for gold. So another thing I tell the students is don't press too hard. Keep it surfacey. So if you're doing a measure trill. So just a very light left hand. Helps, helps those trills work, but again, begin with a measured trill until the student is ready to move into the, the free trill. Um, now the left hand also has voicing. So we have a bass that's sustained. And the tenor line. which really also helps with the shaping of the phrases. So these etudes really have 
it's more often than just specifically one technical issue they're 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 musical but often they the technical aspects work together to create the musical um the musical end result all right let's have a look at another one number 15 sorry number 19. 19. so 19 is for equality with notes of similar values in both hands so of course we're looking for evenness and and clarity of the 16th notes and again it's it's a very uh musical study at the level uh four Uh, it's a good preparation for trills, especially with 4-3. Uh, there's a few a crossing over thumb. So that's a good practice, you know, to, so they get used to turn on the thumb. The thumb plays quite high, so the hand can turn quickly over that. Uh, the balance between the two ends is uh, is a challenge also. And the wrist, it's important for the wrist to, to stay supple uh, throughout the piece. Um, also the left hand, as you can see, has many held notes. So um, it, there's a need there for a supported fifth finger so that we get um, a nice, sound that's kind of um, penetrating, you know what I mean? We can... And this is something that I notice often, I have to tell my students, they, they, have a, they will have a natural tendency to let go of that note. So it's to listen to it, to the sound of it as a base to the whole thing. Um, I found working on it that the fingering is really important. It's very important to figure out the fingering for a good, a good legato touch. And, and also uh, you need to be aware, <laughs> make your decision and stick to them, uh, to be aware uh, of them for the coordination between the hands. Uh, there's a few tricky spots, um, for example, bar 15 and 16. When you go there, there's a question of, okay, which fingers of each hand will collaborate best between each other? You know, the coordination of the fingering left hand, um, right hand. So the student may need to try a few things and see what comes uh, more naturally to, uh, to him or her. Uh, practice tips. Um, it's important to work separate hands, obviously. Uh, slowly with fingers, fing uh, firm fingertips and a flexible, supple wrist. Uh, I would work with rhythms. To work on the evenness. Uh, if you do one, you always do the opposite. So uh, dotted eight note 16, then you switch to 16 dotted um, eight. Uh, you go to, to eight to 16. And 
then my favorite, of course, is one long, three short. And then, ah, let me do that again. Etc., etc. Um, variety is a key word here. Um, and again, yeah, give attention to the fingering for a really nice, beautiful legato line. And now we're moving to the last of the four, number 25. Uh, let me just pull it up here. There we go, number 25. All right, this one is, oh, the other thing that's interesting with this collection is the variety of keys she presents. It's not everything is in C major, G major, F major. She really does, you know, expand to up to four sharps and four flats. So I had a student who I assigned the E major scale to, and she said, oh, I hate E major. I said, well, guess what? I have just the etude for you to help you with E major scale. So I gave her number 25. What I love here is it's not just E major. She goes a bar 10, she goes into the B major. And then the big surprise at bar 15 into E minor. And then G major. So we're going from E major to G major. So a variety of colors in this but also fingering patterns, the awareness of all these accidentals. I think it's a great etude for students to understand what key they're in. So to help with the sound, like does that sound like the right note or the wrong note? What key are you in? Uh, does Is there an A sharp in G major? Whoops, nope. Uh, so being key awareness. I also like the way she alternates between the right hand and the left hand. So we start with right hand scale patterns and then the left hand. So you get that balance. It's not just working right hand scales. Like sometimes you get in the Cherny etudes, one that just focuses on right hand scales. Then you have to find the etude that focuses on left hand scales. Here it's kind of all together plus the variety of keys. And again, fingering is of the utmost importance because uh, if you don't have the correct fingering, you're going to end up with a thumb on a black key and, and stumbles. So really delightful, some really delightful, um, delightful uh, uh, works to go through in this, in this collection. So let's move on. And our next composer is Marie Jen. right right and I'll I'll try to to be short but it's very difficult because she was a very interesting woman and she did a lot uh, she was born in Alsace very close to the German uh, border uh, so her musical background was mostly you know German she was playing a lot of 
German composers. Um, she was, uh, I read that she was passionate, full of energy and of determination. And I found that her last words were, I still have so much to do. So that tells you a lot about, about her personality. She was fascinated by sounds from when she was a baby, birds, whatever sounds. And she said to have been obsessed by the sounds of the piano before she reached the age of six. So she studied in Stuttgart with uh, a, a teacher that's called Fridolin Ama and then Ignaz Moscheles that we all know because of the studies. And then she moved to Paris to study with Henri Hertz. She studied privately with him and then she uh, went to uh, study at the Conservatoire de Paris. So there's constant in, in our uh, presentation today. Uh, she was a student at the Conservatoire de Paris, still with Henri S. And she got her first prize, so her top diploma uh, in 1862. And it said that her playing was noted for its passion. She became a concert pianist, um, a critic from uh, Nuremberg, uh, wrote, she vibrates with enthusiasm for her heart. She plays only because she's driven by an inner force. Marie Trautmann sweeps us over and stirs up, stirs us up. So obviously she was a force of nature. She uh, married uh, Alfred Jael, who was a pianist uh, who already had a career throughout Europe. He knew Chopin, he had worked with Zerny, he was a friend of Francis and of Brahms also. And they started touring Europe, giving uh, two piano recitals. 1870 was a turning point for both of them uh, because of the war between France and Germany. Uh, up to then, like I said, she had made her career playing German composers, but she felt deeply loyal to France and she refused to play in Germany and Alfred was offered a position at the Leipzig Conservatory, he said no. Uh, so they both tapped into the same spirit of nationalism that would also motivate Debussy. Uh, she took composition classes with Camille Saint-Saëns and César Franck and developed a friendship with both of them last, that lasted till the end of their lives. Uh, 1882, her husband dies, she's only 35 years old, and she, from then on, she will bury herself in her work. She had sent some of her pieces to Liz for appraisal, uh, they became close, and for the last four years of Liz's life, she will stay in Weimar for a long period of time. She will work with him as, uh, and for him as proofreader, secretary, co-performer for concerts. And Liszt had a strong influence on her style uh, and on her thoughts regarding touch interpretation and piano pedagogy as she develops her own method uh, known as the touch. As we were saying earlier, the main preoccupation for Louis Farenc as well as for uh, Marie Jael was sonorities, was musicalities, was the technique to the service of the expressivity at the piano. Uh, she will play uh, the integral of Liszt works. Uh, the first one to do so, uh, she will play also all of the Beethoven sonatas and all the works of Schumann. So that was a new thing. And she was the, the first woman, if not the first pianist to, to do integral like that in concerts, um, like six nights in a row. Um, Saint-Saëns and Fauré will nominate her for the Société des Compositeurs de Musique, which was very important at the time. And, and again, as we see often, she's one of the first women to be admitted. And I'd like to, uh, to leave the last word to um, a blogger uh, that I read yesterday. Her name is Emily Ogstad. She's a violinist, freelance arts writer, and she wrote in her blog, Song of the Lark, and I won't, I mean, she used the F word, so I won't say that, but uh, after reading, she says, after reading about Marie Jael, discovering her passionate, restless compositions that were appreciated and played by Liszt and by Saint-Saëns, reading a small amount of her gripping writing and appreciating her passion 
for her piano method and the surprisingly scientific method she used to arrive at it, I find myself asking yet again, how the F did I not know this woman? Uh, talking about books, she, she wrote those uh, artistic movements, the mechanism of touch and music and psychophysiology. Uh, so she spent the last part of her uh, life just analyzing, thinking about this. But again, it's theory, but really applied theory all the time. She was a, a, a very romantic composer, writing often shorter pieces grouped together with descriptive romantic titles. Um, the first of them were published in 1871. Um, in terms of style, you can connect her with Mendelssohn, Schumann, but also she has the virtuosity of Liszt and the clarity and structure um, of Saint-Saëns. There's an influence there of the, the French style. Uh, and as I said earlier, it, she was very interested in pedagogy and psychology related to music, relationship between the body and mind, musical thought, beauty of sound, taste or not mysterious magic, but can be described and worked on thanks to an awareness of the physical movements and appropriate exercises. So again, technique to the service of what we're gonna hear now that illustrate really well our style. So this is the Petite Valse Chantante by Jael. piece this is at a level five and very much voicing bringing out the top notes of the melody and keeping this left hand so a good chance to teach some wrist a uh, gentle wrist motion down up down up two note slurs so we don't end up with which you'd so typically hear from students. So, so floating off the second bass note all the way through, uh, phrasing. Um, it's really a good opportunity also for tonal colors. So if you're looking, I love uh, in bar 21. So let me just play from 16. it also happens in bar seven the the b sharp really lends a lovely color and then when we go through to uh for example bar 26 uh some beautiful uh, harmonies in this it's just it's a very musical piece and a really fun fun piece to teach and a, a good piece for the students to play i think it would be a good recital piece or a competition piece and then let's also have a look at another one of her works. This is the Papillon Gris.
this is a level six piece. And if I, if I was teaching this, I would group the beats together to begin. To give a sense of the phrasing and the harmony. What we do have, she has sustained notes as the top voices. On top of that, two note slurs. So together. So it's a fairly complex piece um, to teach a lot of aspects of it, but some really great teaching material. Uh, again, fingering in order to connect these notes. Uh, the careful fingering does have to be worked out. And then the challenge of the pedal. Now something I've started doing uh, is marking Instead of these pedal marks, I'm going to put an up arrow. I'm not sure if I'm placing that very uh okay, let's over just a wee bit here. I put up arrows where the pedal is to lift because I find what goes up must come down. So it's it's not so much about clearing the pedal, I make sure they lift on the correct note. If they're lifting on the correct note, you get the sound clearing. If I find in teaching, if the pedal marks, they tend to lift after, and then you get the blurring of the sound. They're not really sure it has to be very, very precise. So I find the arrows work extremely well um, just to help clarify the pedal. Um, all right, and then let's move on to Pontife. Pontife, yeah. So another beautiful piece um, that's, um, again, that would be level five. So con de fe means fairy tale. So it opens up to the imagination of the student. that's quite challenging for different reasons. Um, obviously, uh, as you can see, you're constantly moving. Uh, the, uh, it's like the, and, hmm? like the fairies are dancing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you need also to think chords, handprints, so that you can keep the movements to a minimal uh, to a minimum, and you stay relaxed. Uh, of course, uh, that will help also for the evenness, evenness of the eighth note and the quality beauty of sound. Uh, that was our main preoccupation. So the I notes have to be um, clear and bright. Because 
that's where that's where the melody is. Um, so the melody sings and projects. Well, the left hand, as I said, crossing over the right hand. One way to practice that would be, okay, first, just the left hand to kind of figure out, memorize the, um, the, 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 the leaps, the geography of the keyboard, the distances. And then um, I would put the right hand there without playing so that the left hand gets used to the height, just the right height. Um, her, she left her own indications, her own notes, and uh, she mentions that the fact that the fingers, the fifth finger has to play quite high because of that. And the second note of the group shorter it's true here and it's true um when you get to bar 13 uh, where it becomes more of a dialogue again that flexibility of the wrist going down up uh, that movement there down, up. the circular motion is important to get the sound uh the pedal is quite tricky. And uh, like Elena said, you need to change at the exact moment. And also because the, the phrases are of irregular length. So you change with the, with the bass. Uh, but if you see at the beginning, you change after three bars. You have three E's. And then six times one to get the, 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 I was going to say the drive of the line, the direction of the line and the colors that she wants. So she's very, uh, she's very pre precise with her indication of, of battle. Um, and, and then later, if you look 13, 14, you change after two bars, two bars, two bars, two bars. And again, the second page, you'll change with each bass so that it comes. Again, uh, so the, uh, let's say the foot rhythm keeps changing. Uh, yeah, and it would be good to practice also to really have a good idea intellectually as well as physically of, of the chords. Um, yeah. And in terms of position, I, I talked about the fact that the fifth fingers are always high. And when you move, you find yourself in a strange, unusual position for a student. The second is really high but it's also very close to the, to the thumb, which makes it more comfortable. Because it's your old hand that turns. So again, a beautiful piece. And then the last one um, that we wanted to show you is um, Quelques Gouttes de Pluie. Um, it says here, Léger, pas trop vite. So that would be, uh, by the way, uh, level six. So it comes, uh, léger, pas trop vite means light, not too fast. And the way she writes at the beginning, she really thought about it. Uh, it kind of forced you to put the brakes because you have the, you have the rhythm, the 16th apogeature, you know, the third, the, 16 pick up and then you have the apogee and they're not quite together and also she repeat the C that takes some time so she kind of right in a way to make sure that it would be difficult to go too fast uh, so that comes from uh, uh, an album 
uh, of 12 pieces talking only about rainy days. So let me... very descriptive piece, lots of fun. Uh, it's an A minor in 2-4. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's always the interesting rhythmic effect. Uh, and, and this is, to me, the main challenge of the piece. Um, you have to think uh, rotation of the hand in contrary motion, because you're always going Often you have that rotation right, left, right, right, left. Right. Also, uh, later when you have bigger intervals like um, bar 15, 16, and on. So that would be a good idea to play those solid. And of course, the octaves, bar 22. And then you go back to. So also it's the alternate, you have to alternate between this octaves and back to the wrist rotation sideways. Um, the balance between the exchange of voices. At the beginning, the right hand starts. And then the left hand picks up. about the, the dialogue. Um, also a section that's lots of fun is um, at the end, the peu à peu plus vite, uh, a little bit uh, gradually faster, and then retenir peu à peu. So you go faster as you get louder, and then the opposite. You slow down gradually, you slow down gradually, um, with the diminuendo. Um, so yeah, I think that covers pretty much, uh, lots of work, separate hands to get that crispness and the same kind of sound with the left hand as you, you get from the, the right hand. Um, I would play clusters. Again, to, to work on the handprints, uh, always looking for, okay, what's the simplest way to do something? And, and, and then to get the sound, that, that crispness of that. Yeah, but lovely, lovely pieces to discover. It's very musical, very poetic, and a very interesting to work on. Really imaginative, like, very. I, I can see kids playing playing in, in in mud puddles like he jumping and splashing or you know hitting the puddles and it splashes that's what it sounds like yeah all right and then we have mel bonus now we've talked about mel bonus before uh at our webinars so we thought we'd give you a little bit of background on the uh con um, paris conservatoire because everything ties into the conservatoire all of these people were associated with the cons conservatoire so cecile do you want to talk a little bit about where it started and we can kind of yeah, yeah it, it's very uh it's another system uh completely uh typically french that has nothing to do with either you know here we know the word conservatory uh but it means something different that has nothing to do with 
the, the Royal Conservatory of Music, uh, the Conservatory Canada. It, it was um, the origin uh, comes from the French Revolution. Um, it was it started in 17 well it was created in 1789 the year of the French Revolution uh, with um, the music of uh, La Garde Nationale so basically it was the um, the French army uh, the music the musicians from the French army so we're talking of course wind players and they got together with Benjamin Sarret who was the first director of the Conservatoire so he gathered 45 musicians chosen among the, the guards. And it became the free school of the French guard. And, and then in 1795, it became officially uh, Le Conservatoire de Musique, uh, a French um, nas national uh, school of music that would be open to everybody, men and women, and that would be free so free tu tuition it everything is paid by the government by the state of course uh, uh the competition has always been fierce from the very beginning uh it, uh, uh, it they also add a conservatoire uh for um how do you say that um our dramatic actors uh theater okay uh and uh, a dance school so uh, the Conservatoire was the first in institution of higher education open to girls long before universities and the School of Visual Arts. So as I said, it, it was free, it was mixed, but uh, men and women had separate classes and women had limited access. Uh, they could uh, take harpsichord, piano classes, a voice, organ, harp, solfege, but composition, and theory uh, were not open to them. Uh, so you had the mention for men attached to those classes. And it took a long time for those mention to, to disappear. Uh, and you have to, you know, it lasted a long time, but uh, we have to remember that in the 19th century, French society um, was a very divided, society, uh, it, it, it encouraged um, an extreme polarization of sexes. Men and women were very, very separate in, in all fields. So um, men uh, were expected, uh, you know, to men, the professional domain, they, they could uh, become professional pianists, it, the world was open to them. Uh, to women, uh, well, it was more home, uh, so music was more uh, a leisure, creative arts, um, and and so the the programs were were lighter, let's say, um, and uh, but serious as it was perceived as an important um, element of the formation of women. Uh, that if they would play piano well. Uh, the uh, you know they had be better perspectives of a, of a good uh, marriage, and if the family uh, comes into hard times, hardship, uh, they could teach piano and earn a living with this. Um, so it was more accepted. Very few women could become concert pianists, but they could become piano teachers, good piano teachers if need be. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it kind of uh, gave birth to uh, more uh, women who was concerned about piano pedagogy. Uh, at the Conservatoire, uh, you had more and more women teaching um, from 1816 on. Many are assistant professors part-time teachers, they will be responsible for a class, uh, repetiteur, accompanist, uh, but very few will teach, will have a full-time position, let's say. Uh, but it stays like women teach to women and, and for women wishing to compose, uh, it had always to go through the piano. So until 1914, 
women professors were attached only to piano classes, voice, solfege, harmony had opened by then, and accompaniment and figured bass. That being said, um, uh, when the, the Conservatoire de Musique opened in 1795, they had 28 uh, professors, um, and one of them uh, was a woman, Hélène de Monjou, and she was named first class piano professor at the Conservatoire. Uh, she was teaching men as well as women, and she, uh, her salary was equal to uh, her male colleagues. So it's after that that things got, you know, degree, yeah, got um, worse. Uh, as a composer, she, write, she wrote lots of very interesting things. Uh, she's said to have been the missing link between Mozart and Chopin. So a kind of a bridge between classicism and romanticism. Um, she wrote many works for piano, uh, but her main uh, work, I think, is a cours complet pour l'enseignement du piano porté. So a complete course for uh, teaching uh, the, the, the piano. Uh, 972 exercises, 114 études, three fugues of fantasy. And that was part of the mission of the conservatoire is that they would have a method uh, for each instrument. And um, unfortunately, uh, they chose <laughs> The method of the other teacher, Louis Adam, uh, which looking at both, I can't understand really. Uh, he was, but again, we're going back to what we were saying earlier. Uh, there was a, a choice between going towards more um, musicality, sounds, uh, and versus mechanism. So uh, Louis Adam is the title of his method. It's called. La mécanique des doigts, the mechanism of the fingers. So that tells you that tells you all. Um, so I, I get the feeling from what I read that she was a bit upset by by that choice from the conservatoire, and she left. Um, so uh, the I the de Paris, I have to say, was a model for all the conservatoires because it, it, it developed. And so every, you, you have conservatoire, the same model uh, across France in many, many cities. And that is that was the model for all the conservatoires de musique du Québec in, in Quebec. Also, uh, also the model for other cities in, in, um, in Europe, like Leipzig started admitting women in 1843. And then the, I was reading yesterday, the um uh in moscow conservatory yes also, they were all built on sort of that same model and tremendous competition to get into the conservatory yeah and and to show you how it, how it evolved uh if Mongeau was teaching boys in 1795 louis Farenc, who was appointed in 1842 uh could only teach girls um and the classes stayed separate till 1915. And it's Gabrielle Faure who changed that. Actually, did you know that women had to be chaperoned by their mothers? Uh, so they weren't, it was only in 1850 that mothers were permitted to attend the lessons and their anecdotes about how the mothers were bored and they would sit there and, and doze off or knit, but they had to be in the class to chaperone their daughters. And actually what happened also by the early 20th century, there were so many females that uh, the conservative commentators displayed anxiety about the economic, the cultural and moral implications of the female presence, too, much, too many females at the conservatoire. Yeah. So yeah. It was quite, quite amazing. And the the courses, the harmony courses for women were watered down because women were were perceived as being emotional, but not intellectual. So the courses that were taught to the women were taught on a, on a 
excuse me, a lower level than, than the courses taught to men. Now also what's interesting is there are a lot of salon type pieces that were composed in the 1800s right up until the 1900s and they're you know they're they're kind of the I guess like pop music today some of them have some validity and some of them are just pieces like there there's no real emotional substance but women were encouraged to play at home as you mentioned earlier this made them more desirable as as a potential wife so they would entertain and the pieces were also more technically uh, were technically easier because again women didn't have the ability or were perceived to not have the ability to play anything more technically complex so we have a lot of these salon type pieces that were composed for women to play at home and actually reading yesterday this is really actually rather disturbing in 2013 2013 not that many years ago bruno mantovi head of the paris conservatoire declared conducting to be too demanding for women in 2013 conducting is too physical the travel is too demanding and it is too difficult to have children in this career because that is what all women want is children so there was never any option that maybe a woman would like to pursue a career this is simply not an option. so i thought 2013 like wow how far have we come or have we come well, out yeah and that's one thing that's fine you know uh, you're talking about women composers I'm in 1995, which is not that long ago, there was still a, a professor in a university in Ontario who was teaching history class uh, and who, who was saying, uh, would tell his students that women cannot compose because their brain is not wired the same as, as men. And, you know, everybody knew that that's what the professor was thinking, but it was still accepted. So, and that what frightens me uh, a little bit is that looking back, studying this, the history of women composers, women performers through the ages, is, is that um, so often there is opening, doors are opening, and then something happens, a social event, or and then whoops, it closes and it's it, it, it's going backwards. You know what I mean? And and so I just hope that the work we're doing uh, at the moment, uh, opening, will stay. That in 30, 50 years, uh, we'll all know about those women, the works of those women, uh, that they will still be playing and not forgotten. Absolutely. Like, well, I mean, that. With publishing these works, that's been the whole, the whole object is to, I mean, when I started, I heard a lecture two years ago at the MTNA online, the virtual conference, and I thought, oh, well, there's you know, women composers, this is probably enough for one volume. I had no idea. <laughs> No idea. In fact, next week I'm, I'm going to the University of Michigan to, they have the largest collection of works by women composers, to look at that collection because there are a number of composers there I've never heard of. So I'm really looking forward to seeing who else is out there, you know, all these women that have been yeah. stuffed and in libraries and, and their work's not known and there's, there's so much beautiful music. Yeah. And yeah. you see, to get back to uh, Farhank, uh, Monjou was played the same, uh, but not with Farhank. And she had to fight, like for 10 years, she had to fight to get equal pay. And she also complained of discrimination, uh, contesting the fact that if women could only teach women, uh, male teachers could teach both and would often get um, take the most promising female students in their own classes um so yeah move forward with mel bonus who was a classmate of wc's we all know WC's, but how many of us knew about bonus <laughs> so this is let's go back to screen sharing here and i'm going to play for you 
Oh, okay, just a minute here. And Melbonius was one who benefited, um, you know, there's many of, of those women who had a very strong formation, musical formation, who took compositions, uh, composition classes with very well-known composers. Um, uh, it was a case with, uh, with, with those women. And um, some teachers even said that uh, they realized the talent of those women and and they gave them the, the 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 same they taught them the same way they were teaching their men classes at the conservatoire uh so there's a lot of um i was going to say that there's a certain luck into this uh that uh it came to the teachers to say to decide that they were worthy of the same instruction and to be open-minded enough to give them the, the, the knowledge, to communicate their knowledge to them. All right, this is Marielle of Piano. three piece and this is a wonderful piece uh, to learn about a left hand melody so first of all getting a clear finger action that we don't with with that type of sound making sure fingers four and five are strong and properly curved and able to maintain the weight to get the left hand melody to sound, I find it's, it students find it difficult to listen to a melody in the other hand. So I'll have the student play the right hand up on the top of the piano. So it's a good way of still f having the physical aspect of playing both hands but the right hand is quiet so they can clearly hear what's happening in the left hand and it helps to direct their ears to what the left hand is doing. Um, at the end of the piece with the chords, uh, bonus has an indicated pedal but you could pedal the quarter notes and the half notes so that you get a, a legato line and of course projecting the top notes of the right hand. And if you look at the main, that's what we have at the end. Just with different note values. So charming little piece. Um, not outrageously difficult, but it does have, it's, it's really almost like an etude. So it has some uh, really terrific technical value. And then there's, oops, okay, let's go to the. And another one, uh, uh, similar, um, some similar challenges, do some E.
So again, having the left hand melody project in the right hand, staying very close to the key so we don't get it riding the keys. It's like riding a horse. You stay in contact. So it involves some flexibility of the wrist to maintain that. So again, you could practice the right hand on the top of the piano or on the wooden part of the piano uh, to help the left hand project, to be able to hear that left hand. When we reach bar 7, 8, 9, 10, the melody transfers to the right hand. But the left hand also has some interesting harmonies. And then the sustained. So there's a lot happening technically in this piece, um, along with musical aspects. So again, a very charming piece a very good recital or competition piece. There's a lot in it in terms of a comp uh, playing it in a competition, a lot of value in it, a lot of details. If the student is able to master all of those, um, they would do very well with this piece. And then Cecile? Yeah, and then um, compliment grand-mama, uh, that would be a level three piece. Uh, a compliment, in French, uh, it, it means an expression of both deep affection and respect. Uh, Mel Bonis uh, wrote those pieces uh, from uh, the album Politruetti for her grandchildren. And she had a very close relationship with all of them. And so this is a, a lullaby, basically. So you have a very tender and very lyrical melody with um, an Alberti bass pattern in the left hand. And it's in F major. challenges. Uh, of course, uh, there's a very smooth legato that's needed in the right hand and the balance between the melody and the Alberti bass accompaniment that has to stay uh, soft. Um, also, uh, in the second part, the uh, the phrasing becomes irregular. And it comes back like that, bar 14. That makes it really interesting. Um, practice tips, of course, the melody and the left hand. Um, I would yes, but going back to uh, Monjaru, she talked about singing, about how the piano technique should emulate singers and you should breathe. Yeah. And I think this is a perfect piece where, you know, you can, with the phrasing, if you breathe with the phrasing, if you, you know, sing the melody and breathe at the ends of phrases, it happens quite naturally. And that seemed to be very much the premise of her teaching. Yes, absolutely. And the title, Compliment Grand Maman, evokes that too. You yeah. see you see a child uh, either singing a song or um, uh, reading a poetry. You know what I mean? So yeah, the breath, uh, the shaping of the phrase is very important. And uh, or use uh, the dynamics also have to be worked on carefully to 
to make that piece very expressive. And of course, the Alberti bass, you know, again, rhythm, or and and you play um, the, the the melody legato and the left hand staccato to to keep it light. Uh, and um, as I said, the dynamics, uh, she's quite precise, uh, especially considering the, the level, but it goes with the shaping of the phrase. And if the, the child sings it, it will, she will feel it physically. Um, and then it's a, really a matter of putting all those elements together to give an expressive and musical interpretation. It's the integration of all the, the elements. But it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And the last one that we'd like to present to you is uh, Monsieur Vieux-Bois, also at the level three. Um, I was really curious, uh, the, 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 the title, uh, Monsieur Vieux-Bois, dot, 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 why? So I did some research because I was wondering, what does that mean? Why? And it turned out, I found that it's the first um, comic books uh, published. And it was published in Switzerland in 1837, it was in French. It was called uh, Les Amours de Monsieur Vieux-Bois. And it's a comic book with, uh, I think it was 84 uh, drawings. And uh, published in 1837, but the book stayed popular in France throughout uh, the 19th century uh, to a point where uh, there's a, a silent film that was made in 1921 with the original drawings. And if, uh, if you're interested, it's on YouTube uh, and the book is available too. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting. And the dot, 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 because it's a long story. It, it tells the story of a man who goes for a walk in the park in Paris and he meets a girl and he, he loves that first sight. And, and then he starts escorting and at first she's not really interested and he does what he does to, you know, to please her and is up and down. And so, yeah, it's a many, many stories with this. Allegro dans le tropeau, Pimpin and Guiret. Pimpin means um, dashing, dapper, stylish, spruce. And Guiret means cheerful, playful, perky. So it's an F major cut time. And it goes as follow. little piece. Um, the challenge is, of course, it's you're alternating right hand, left hand, left hand, right hand. And um, it, it play a lot uh, uh, with two, the second fingers. And then there's alternating right, left. So importance of fingering again. You, the, the child really has to think about what to do and how and when. Um, it's in cut time and it, uh, it's very important to have a clear pause for the, the funny character. Um, to me, it really evokes uh, a comic book. Uh, the strong beat, weak beats, it's a perfect piece to, to talk about that with the, the, the students. Um, one interesting point is uh, if you see at the bottom uh, again she put that position there she uses that where the right hand is on top of the left 
for some students, I, I've had some students for whom that was really not comfortable and tricky. So it's good to just have the left hand there in position and the right hand placed above. So they get used to that position first. Um, it helps to play clusters when you have groups of two notes like. Again, uh, to memorize what's the best position for the hand to play those notes and minimize the movement, make things as easier as possible. Uh, and it helps also for the, the physical memory. Um, another thing that I found helpful for the repeated notes, uh, starting bar 10. There's a uh, question of clear pulse, but there's also a question of rhythmic stability. So um, I like to, um, to use the, the third and thumb together. The, the donut position. Uh, I find that that helps to keep the rhythmic stability and the stability in, in the sound also. Um, but a really fun piece to play. It's it's really delightful, actually. It, mm -hmm. uh, I just think some of the little boys I teach uh, that would be a really fun piece for them, uh, especially yeah. if you you know if they watch the video or you know drew a drew a picture of who they perceive as uh, Mr. Viobo. Yeah, and the drawings are really really nice. Yeah, yeah, and and you have a connection there between what you're playing and and it gives them also a perspective on the past, an historical per perspective, yeah. you know, connecting with something that happened like 175 years ago. I like to tell, you know, I like to tell things, stories about the composers to my students because they're not dead people. Uh, these are people that actually lived and, you know, what was a birthday party like in, in Box Day? What would you do at a birthday party? Just to get their imaginations going, that it's not just music by dead composers. And some of the humorous aspects of, of their lives, you know, Haydn especially, I always think if I could go out to dinner with anybody, you know, a, a, a composer that lived, I think Haydn would have been a really fun guy to go to dinner with. So. They're, they were human beings. They weren't uh, composers who were cerebral. These were human beings that had a you know, sense of humor, that had emotion. So I think it's important if, you know, to make that, for students to make that connection. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and thanks both of you for making those connections for us and bringing these composers to life, bringing their music to life. It just, it's amazing how, how exciting the music is and just we've never had access to almost all of this music until now. Thanks to your efforts, Eleanor and Cecile. Um, tell us, you're gonna be back next month, is that right, on December 2nd, is that correct? Yeah. What do you have for us on December 2nd? We've got more of the French Connection, and this time the composers, let me just uh, pull this up here. It's a little more advanced repertoire, and we're doing, again, Mel Bonus, Cecile Chaminade and Charlotte Sohi. Excellent. I've enjoyed all of their compositions and some of the earlier volumes that you published last year. Uh, really remarkable stuff. Sorry, what's that, Eleanor? Did you say something there? Just some really terrific, fabulous music. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks both of you for bringing this all to life again for us and, and, and giving it to us in such an amazing lecture demonstration format. Um, it's really engaging and great to see. I hope everyone will check out the replay of this webinar and the others that you've done. You have your own playlist on the YouTube channel where you can see all of Cecile and Eleanor's webinars from the past and all the future ones will be located there as well. You know, I'm not seeing any questions here. We have a slightly smaller audience live with us today. If anyone here has any questions, please throw them in the Q&A, raise your hand, throw them in the chat box in the next moment, and we'll be sure to get those answered for you. 
Otherwise, you can join these two again on December 2nd for more of the French Connection, as they mentioned, more of the senior composers. I'd encourage you to check out uh, next week, next Friday again, uh, Dr. Elaine Keeler will be with us again to talk about ornamentation. I suspect she may even be playing from that amazing forte piano of Clementi again for us as she demonstrates. Dr. Gilles Como the week after that on Friday, November 18th. I'll be in a different studio that day. I'll be, I'll be down at our head office in London, Ontario that week. So I'm looking forward to that. I haven't been there for three years since the pandemic started. So I'm looking forward to that little bit of travel again. And uh, not seeing any questions here for either of you today, uh, but some thanks coming up there in the queue or in the chat box. Glad you all seem to be enjoying this. And we look forward to connecting next Friday. And Cecile, Eleanor, thanks so much for today. And we look forward to seeing you on December 2nd again for the next installment of this. Thank thanks. you. Okay, Bye. thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Okay.